The title to this morning's message is Making Sense of Personal Tragedy. The text is taken from John chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. We would, could read the whole chapter, but we won't for the sake of time this morning. It's the story of a man born blind and Jesus healing this man. I'd like for you to go with me just for a few minutes to the scene of this um, text. Probably on the Temple Mount, it's an ancient city of Jerusalem, and there's a blind man. And he is begging. He is standing by the roadside. He stations himself there every day to beg. And people come by, and he hopes that they'll give him some money. He asks for alms, and he hopes that they'll give him some money. And these beggars would watch the crowd as they came and, and would be able to size up if someone looked like a likely donor, except this man couldn't. He couldn't size up people coming up. He could only listen. It's possible he had another beggar beside him to let him know when somebody was showing up, but not likely in this case. He hears the sound of voices coming. He hears footsteps coming. And the footsteps stop in front of him, and that's a good sign for him. It may be well that somebody is going to give him some money. But he overhears a conversation as he's there, and someone raises the issue of sin. I doubt that he does it so quietly, so the blind man must overhear. Who sinned, this man or his parents? That's the question. I wonder if this blind man has ever asked himself that question. Who sinned or his parents that he's born blind? I suspect the blind man is curious at this point. Who is this that's talking? The man answers, Neither the sin of this man nor that of his parents is the explanation for his physical infirmity. This man's condition has been sovereignly ordained so that the works of God might be revealed through him. I can imagine a chill going up the spine of this this blind man. The works of God. This sounds somewhat hopeful. The steps get a little closer and all of a sudden he hears somebody spit and he says, oh, he missed. Good, 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 he missed. He'd probably been spit at before by some teenager or some religious person. And then all of a sudden he feels something being put, being put on his eyes. He feels this like a gooey stuff put in his eyes. And he's like, what in the world is going on? What in the world is happening? And then the voice says, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. He didn't promise, he wasn't promised healing, but he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And then the entourage moves off. So this man walks some distance if he was in fact at the, at the temple and goes to the pool of Siloam and washes. It wasn't only because he was instructed to do so, but it was necessary to get this dirt out of his eyes. He washes and as he washes away that dirt, he can all of a sudden see what's going on. And I can imagine that there was some shouting going on in that pool. But it was amazing, amazing, the healing that happened to that man. Making sense of personal tragedy is the topic of today's message. Probably all of you have, have experienced some personal tragedy in your experience. Some of us more than others. Some tragedy, something ha that happened in your, in your life that is, is very personal in nature and very tragic. Maybe it's, it's the news that you got at the doctor's. Uh, it's cancer. Uh, maybe an accident that happened in your experience. All of us, I think, have been brushed by some type of tragedy. I, I was thinking as I was working on this message, especially the Swery family. You know, a year ago about, you think of that tragedy that happened. What now? Why? Why did this happen? What's going on here? 
And some of the first questions that we ask ourselves in a tragedy, is it something that I've done wrong? Is it some sin that I have committed that this tragedy happens to me? Is there something that God is, is punishing me for? And, and, you know, that's a normal response, I think, for all of us, is to ask that question. Is, is this something personal? The, the book of Job is all about this. This man who had been living a godly life, but all of a sudden all this tragedy happened, and he spends a good part of that book in, on, out on the ash pile asking why. Why did this happen? Why, how could this happen to me? Did I do something wrong? The Gospel of Luke tells of, of a situation. I'd like for you to listen up to it just for a minute here. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Legitimate question. This tragic thing happens. Were they, are they bigger sinners because uh, that caused this tragic thing to happen? And the Pharisees, I think, were saying yes. Yes, they're sinners. That's why it happened to them. Jesus says no. No. That's not why it happened. The school shooting down in Florida that's been in the news so much recently, were these extra bad young people that got killed? The answer is likely no. I, I, I've been a little scared in a way sharing on a subject like this because God has a way of testing a preacher. I don't know if you realize that. But Monday morning, something may happen, and I am going to be asking that question. You know, what's going on here, God? Why is this happening in my life? But I trust that I can react to it properly. If you have your Bibles open to John chapter 9, I want to read that text. But I will only read the first seven verses that if you had... I would encourage you to read the whole chapter at your convenience. And you're probably quite familiar with the story. John 9, verse 1 says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. And he said, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Amazing miracle. That happened. I want to, this morning in the message, talk about a couple of things related to tragedy that we can learn perhaps from this story of the, of the blind man. And the first point I would like to make is that there is often no direct link between personal sin and personal tragedy. There's often no direct link between personal sin and personal tragedy. I was 10 years old when I was struck by lightning. Uh, down in Belize, we were playing checkers, my father and I, upstairs in our house. Sunday afternoon, beautiful Sunday afternoon. And uh, we had some amazing thunderstorms that would come up in the afternoon there in Belize. And this storm, this storm was a really bad one. I found, we found out later it, it hit a tree in a neighbor's farm there and had killed a bunch of cattle. It was a very, very uh, potent storm. And that, uh, that storm struck the, struck the room where I was in. Uh, came in right in through a shuttered window, came right in there and, and 
busted a nightstand right beside the bed. I was in pieces. The room was filled with smoke. And uh, it knocked one of the bedposts under out of it. And, and I had burns down my, down my torso. My feet were numb. And I couldn't feel anything for hours after that. My ears were ringing. It was so loud. And Dad, God bless him, he was shook up. He said, we shouldn't have been playing checkers. We shouldn't have been playing checkers on Sunday <laughs> afternoon. We shouldn't have been done doing that. I don't think it was wrong to play checkers on Sunday afternoon. I don't think it was wrong to do that. And I don't think there was anything that we were doing that brought that lightning strike. But that's a question we ask when something happens in our lives. What did we do wrong? And there is often no direct link between often, I say, and sometimes there is, but there is often no direct link between personal sin and personal tragedy. Sin is the cause of all this. Sin is the cause. We know that when sin came into the world, it brought all this kind of tragedy but not necessarily the sin of this blind man that caused this tragedy to happen in his life. You go down and walk through the hospital ward. You walk through a nursing home and you see the results of sin. Sin came into the world and brought all this tragedy, all this suffering and disease and death. But it's not personal with you necessarily. It could be, but it usually isn't. It often is not. Sometimes it is. Sometimes tragedy is the result of sin. I think of, of births out of a young child being born out of wedlock. I think of drug addiction. I think of an accident that may have occurred during a drunk, because of a drunk driver. These kinds of things are the direct result of sin. Second point I'd like to make to the message this morning is that God is at work in our losses. God is at work in our losses. I was so blessed when I, when I, when I read uh, someone else's writing on this. And I, I can relate to this, this woman, Naomi, in the Old Testament. You all are familiar with the story of Naomi and Ruth. Making sense of personal tragedy. God is at work in our losses. The story begins with a famine in the land of Israel. Things got really bad financially. Her husband probably didn't have anything to work. The, the crops weren't doing well. There, there was uh, Elimelech, Elimelech, the husband, and, and the two, two boys, Malan and Killian. And things got really bad, and, they try, and, and this financial situation got so bad that they ended up deciding to move. They pulled up stakes, moved out of out of the land of Israel over into Moab, which was a, a, a heathen country. And uh, I'm sure that was a very tough thing to do. They had tried cutting back on spending. They had sold everything, their house and their donkeys and everything. And they were in survival mode. And they were very, pretty desperate at this point. They moved to this foreign country, but Naomi still has, has all her people with her. She has her husband and her two boys. And they still have hope. It's tough, but they're going to make it. They're going to make it together. And then her husband gets sick. Elimelech gets sick. He gets worse and worse and worse, and then he dies. Elimelech passes away. And I think Naomi was crushed. Naomi is crushed with that, what happened. The man who had been the rock in her life was now gone. The man you could depend on was now gone. And... Her world was just fell apart. She raised those two boys by herself as a single parent, uh, Malin and Killian. And the years pass by, and I think she throws herself into raising these two boys. And they, they, they grew up well, and they got married to local, local girls. They're Moabite girls. And things were, were starting to look up, I think. And then one of the boys gets sick. And then another boy gets sick. And I can just see Naomi's world falling under eyes. She said, this looks so familiar. 
This looks so familiar. I've seen this before. And they both die. And Naomi's hope is crushed. She had no future. In those days, women had no future without a family. Their, their futures were, today, the women are, can be more independent. But in those days, everything was tied up in a family. You, you, to have a future, you had to have a family. And now, uh, Naomi was an older widow. And she couldn't get married again and have more children. And she didn't have any children to carry on the family name and provide for her in her old age. So she, she heads back to Israel, back to her home country, and uh, a totally broken widow. And the, the people ask when they see Naomi coming into the country, say, is this Naomi? Is this Naomi? And the, the word, the name Naomi in, in Hebrew meant sweet. She said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. That's what that is. Call me bitter for of all the stuff that has happened to me. I think in all that, her hope is gone in life. No future for an old widow but to take up begging and live under a bridge with belongings in a shopping cart. And there... The story of Naomi in the book of Ruth is, is somewhat unusual in the Old Testament. We don't see any dramatic miracles happening. No big fish to come along and swallow, them, swallow her. No burning bush. No amazing miracle. But God was still there in Naomi's losses. God was still there in Naomi's losses. And God is still there in our losses. We've got to believe that. When tragedy hits us, when things go wrong, when someone gets very sick, we lose someone that we love, we fall on hard times, God is still there, and God is still working in our losses. We've got to believe that. We've got to believe that God is still working. There is nothing that happens to us that God isn't aware of and doesn't allow to happen. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? We've got to believe that, that God allowed to happen what happened to us. God was there working on behalf of Naomi in all of her losses. He broke the famine in Israel so she could go back home. God convicted Ruth to go to Israel to be with Naomi. God provided the kinsman, kinsman redeemer for Ruth to marry so that Naomi's family could continue. Naomi couldn't see it. Ruth probably couldn't see it. Boaz, didn't know, Boaz may not have known what was going on. He just fell in love with this young Moabite widow. One scholar puts it like this. God is most powerfully present even when he seems most conspicuously absent. God is most powerfully present when he seems most conspicuously absent. Even though we can't see God working in our losses, he's there. Hallelujah. He is there. And God gave Ruth to Naomi as a means of his grace. I'd like for you to think about that for just a minute. God gave Naomi Ruth as a measure of his grace. And isn't that the way it often is in our experience with deep loss? God gives us someone. God gives us someone as a means of his grace. Someone beautiful like Ruth. Someone when we need someone so badly. I would like for you to listen to Ruth's commitment to her mother-in-law. Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you, wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me se severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. God is at work in our losses. And the story of Naomi has a very happy ending. Listen again to Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast and she cared for him as if he were her own. 
The neighbor woman said, Now at last Naomi has a son again, and they named him Obed. Oh, he became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. God is at work in our losses. The third point I'd like to make this morning is that some tragic circumstances are allowed by God to reveal the work of God. That's what our text says there in John 9. Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. The works of God displayed in us. That's an amazing thing. I think this man probably cried himself to sleep many times, especially as a young man when he was blind. He, he couldn't work. He was there begging and he probably shook his fist at God and said, Why, God, why did this have to happen to me? And then Jesus comes along and says, This, is, this happened not because this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God would be displayed in him. There would be other accounts in Scripture. I think of the, of the story of Joseph. Joseph experienced personal tragedy to no end. He, he sold into Egypt. He kept being thrown further and further down into the dungeon. And I, I'm sure he was asking, why this tragedy? Is it something I did? But no, it wasn't. God was working. God was working in his life. Joseph understood what we must never forget. God is in control. There is nothing God cannot make happen. There is nothing he cannot keep from happening. Why does God allow painful tragedy to happen to his children that he dearly loves? And the answer is found in a very, very familiar scripture. You could always cite it by memory. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. That's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing scripture. In the times of tragedy, God is at work for good, even though we may not be able to see it. Nothing happens to a believer without God allowing it. Nothing. Everything that comes, reaches us, has to pass through the loving hand of God. And we don't understand. That's a th tough thing. I don't understand what's going on. What in the world is going on here? And when it really gets to me, and it, is, it does probably to you, is when it just keeps on coming, right? Right? It just keeps on coming. It doesn't stop. We can take like one little bit of tragedy and we kind of write it off when we say, okay, maybe God has a purpose on it. Then it keeps on coming. It keeps on coming and it keeps on coming. And sometimes, and this is the neat thing, sometimes God gives us a glimpse of what he's doing. I've had that happen to me. I have laughed out loud. I have laughed out loud when I see God, a little glimpse of what God is doing in a situation. It's so, so rewarding to know that God is working in a situation. I want to share with you a story, and you all know this person. You may have actually gone to listen to him at Liberty over here. His name is Steve Saint, and he wrote that book at the end of the spear. In 1986, Steve Saint was traveling through the country of Mali when his car broke down. Stranded and alone, Steve tried to rent a truck despite warnings that he wouldn't survive in the Sahara Desert. After he failed to find a truck in, in fear and discouragement, Steve's thoughts ran to his father, Nate Saint, a former missionary in Ecuador. When Steve was only five, natives, appeared, natives feared to death his dad and four other missionaries. Now, 30 years later, Steve found himself questioning his father's death. Steve reflected, I could, couldn't help but think the murderers, were, the murderers were capricious, an accident of bad timing. When Steve asked some locals directions to a church, this was over in Mali, a few children led him to a tiny mud brick house with a poster on the wall showing wounded, wounded hands covering a cross. A man in flowing robes introduced himself as Nuf Af Afa Yatara. Nuf started sharing with Steve about his faith in Christ. After becoming a Christian, his family disowned him. His mother even put a sorcerer's poison 
in Nuth's food at a family feast. He ate the food but suffered no ill effects. When Steve asked Nuth why he was willing to pay such a steep price for following Christ, he simply said, I know God loves me and I'll live with him forever. But Steve pressed, where did you get your courage from? Nuth explained that when he was young, a missionary gave him books about Christians who had suffered for their faith. Then he added, my favorite was about five young men who risked their lives to take God's good news to people in the jungles of Ecuador. The book they said, book said they let themselves be speared to death, even though they had guns and could have killed their attackers. Utterly shocked, Steve said, one of those men was my father. Now Nuf felt stunned. Your father, he exclaimed. Then Nuf told Steve that God had used the death of those five brave missionaries to help him, a young Muslim who had become a Christian, hold on to his faith. Steve realized that if God could plan the death of his own son, he could also plan and use the death of Steve's dad, Nate Saint, to accomplish his sovereign purpose, including reaching one young Muslim for Christ and orchestrating this God-ordained meeting of two men at the ends of the earth. It's an amazing story. Our experiences are uniquely ours. No one else has gone through what we have. And God wants to use this for his glory. Number four. Personal tragedy can be used to point people to God. Making sense of personal tragedy. Personal tragedy can be used to point people to God. It does, and it has been. I'm one of those persons who like to reason with people. I like to present truths. I like to teach them and, and, and go to the scriptures and, and give them all the proofs about why they should be saved or, or what, what, why you should make good choices. But that's not often how people are saved. It's often... People seeing the testimony of someone and their, their experience with Christ and how maybe they've even come through personal tragedy and have received Christ. And that speaks to a greater, speaks more strongly perhaps than all the reasoning that we can do. I think sometimes I, I don't have a real strong testimony. I don't know if you're in the same boat I am. I grew up as in a Christian setting, grew up in a Christian church, and I enjoyed going to church. I grew up in, it wasn't dramatic. My salvation wasn't dramatic. But there are others who need to hear that. They need to hear that testimony. They need to hear those experiences that I've had with the Lord and be pointed to, to God. Okay, I want to... Wrap up the message this morning with some practical things that I think we should do when tragedy strikes. When tragedy comes to your door, this is just some advice. This may not be good advice for you, but it possibly could be. What do we do when, when something really tragic happens to us and, and we're questioning it? We don't know why it's happened. It doesn't make any sense to us. It doesn't make any sense at all why this should have happened. When tragedy comes to your door, number one, be active. Stay active. Stay active in your Christian experience. Don't, don't, don't let it fall back. You may be questioning, is there sin in my life that God is speaking to? It may be. Most times it's not. Most times it's not personal sin, but it could be that there is something in your life that God is speaking to you about. In your response to tragedy, you should ask that question. Is God trying to say something to me? Confess any known sin. Confess any known sin that you may have in your experience. Ask others to pray for your healing. Look for lessons you should be learning. Open your eyes and your ears. Be alert. Sometimes that God is chasing us. And we need to be careful about that when we're in tragedy. It wasn't that way for the blind man in our story. And we can't assume that it is for someone else. But it may be for us. And we need to carefully ask that question. I want to read for you a passage out of Hebrews 12. 
In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood and have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. God may be bringing discipline in our life, and we should ask that question. Number two, we should be faithful. We need to be active, continue to be active in our Christian walk, and then be faithful. Don't, don't, don't give up. I use the term batten down the hatches. And it's, like, it's a nautical term, obviously, of a, of a ship or a submarine. When the storm is there, you, you just take those hatches and you batten them down. You just put them down. You put down the hatches. You put down the hatches. You batten up. The storm is there. Don't do anything drastic. Don't, don't go off on the deep end somewhere and curse God and die. Don't do anything crazy. When, this, when the disaster hits, batten down the hatches. If your life is, if you are serving God, just, just keep on going straight. Just keep on going straight. Don't, don't, don't do anything drastic. When, be, be faithful. There's a storm going all around me. And I'll, I'll, my personal testimony, there's a storm going on all around me right now. This, this, these church things have just torn me up. And, and, and I've decided that I'm going to batten down the hatches. I'm going to batten down the hatches. And I'm going the path that God is asking me to go. As he gives me light, I'm going to batten down the hatches. And, and God will show you down the road. Keep doing what's right. Keep doing what's right. Don't, don't get radical. Keep going straight. Number three. Be patient. The Bible says that we see through a glass darkly now, but then face to face. The darkness that surrounds us, the questions that are around us, they won't always be that way. Be patient. Keep on. Don't pretend to understand when you don't understand. Be patient. And just a word, a side note to myself and any of you, don't go tell other people all those beautiful answers to their tragedy. Because you don't know. You really don't know. You don't know why it's happened to them. Oh, you're thinking in your mind, my, that young person, that tragic thing happened to him to, 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 for this reason, for that person, that reason. You don't know. And it's very can be very harmful to go over to someone and say, okay, you know, you straighten up. God is talking to you here. You straighten up. It may have nothing to do with that person, his life or her life. It may be God is just trying to work something else out. I don't want to come across giving trite answers. There aren't easy answers. I will also affirm that there are no accidents. I'm convinced there is coming a day when the veil will be pulled back and we will see clearly. And in seeing clearly, we will worship. We will fall down and worship God and say, God, thank you for letting that happen to me. Thank you for caring for me. Thank you for being there in my losses and being the, the help that I needed. Making sense of personal tragedy. The blind man, up until his healing, I don't think made any sense of it. The people there, the religious people of that day, didn't make any sense of it. But Jesus, I think, made sense of it. And the blind man saw that the work of God was working in him, and he believed. We know his story was good. He ended up good because he... He asked uh, Jesus, who are you that I may believe on him? And he told him that he was the Messiah, that it was he. We don't know when personal tragedy may strike. It could happen today for any of us. We don't know. We dare not make judgments 
about tragedies in the lives of others. We know that God is working in our lives as believers for our good. And we do know that we can ride out the storm and the losses with God's grace and God's help. Be active, be faithful, be patient. And God wants to use our personal tragedy for his glory and for a witness to other people. God bless you.